All right. Isaiah 57 tonight. We'll wrap up the last three verses in Isaiah 56 and then into Isaiah 57 as we finish this section of Isaiah. By section, I'll do a quick review of the book as we step back here and remind us where we're at among this forest of Isaiah. Isaiah is generally split up into two sections, chapters 1 through 39 and then chapter 40 through 66. And the first section, uh, the first 39 chapters, generally speak more toward the judgment and the, and the sentencing of Jerusalem and Zion and, and, and Judah for their sins. So there's a lot of chapters about judgment there. There are interspersed amongst those uh, judgments uh, prophecies of blessing in the kingdom throughout there. But mo mostly judgments against Israel, judgment against the nations for their sins. It's that uh, judgment from the king. The second half, chapter 40 through 66, is more uh, good news. It's salvation to Israel. And so this is what we've been covering the last uh, few months now, starting chapter 40. And chapter 40 through 66 are divided up into three sections. Uh, and you, they're on the top of your outline here, each of them nine chapters each. Each of them uh, end with the phrase, there's no peace to the wicked. Which doesn't sound like salvation, but it's those phrases at the end of the sections that kind of stick out because the rest of the chapters generally talk about salvation and the coming Savior and Messiah and how Israel's going to return. And at the end of each section, there's a small segment of, and you're a bunch of sinners and you're going to pay for it unless you trust the Messiah. And so uh, we see in Isaiah 40 through 48, the theme there was the Israel of God identifying true Israel and how God would deliver them and bring them back to their city and their land. So it's their deliverance, his deliverance and their return to the land. In the second section, which we're now finishing tonight, uh, the theme there is the servant of God. So instead of speaking about Israel and bringing them back to the city as a major theme, the major theme in the last nine chapters has been identifying the servant, which has been brought up before. But uh, in this section, it's a lot about the servant's uh, humiliation and him being humbled to serve God and to help Israel. And so it's his mission to save Israel and showing God's mercy towards Israel. And so in this section, then you have this gospel being preached to Israel saying, this is what needs to happen. And this is how it's going to happen for you to return as far as uh, the salvation from the servant of God. This last section, which will begin next week, the last nine chapters, deals with the kingdom of God then. So the last nine chapters, the major theme is the reign of this Messiah. That wasn't the theme in this last section. It was the humiliation, the humbling of the Messiah. We spent two months in Isaiah 53, and that was all about the servant's humiliation unto death, right? So these last nine chapters starting next week will be about the reign of the Messiah and the reign of Israel and the glory, their glory of Israel, the glory of God on earth in that people, okay? So that, that's, that's where we're at in Isaiah. We're right before that last section. So it's going to get interesting to talk more about this literal kingdom on the earth that will be in glory, which Paul says... If the fall of Israel brings salvation to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And that's what these next nine chapters are. It's like when Israel gets saved and their fullness comes to this earth, it's going to be glorious. And so this is what we'll be reading about uh, to come. And we'll see how that differs from what's going on today. We preach the glorious gospel, the grace of God, and there's a glory that's going to be talked about in the next nine chapters. But it's not the glory of God's grace in a body. It's the glory of God manifest in His people Israel over the nations of the earth. So we'll be dealing with that also. So this is where we're at. The review of this last section then has talked about the day of salvation for Israel, what they need to do to be saved, uh, identifying this servant humbled to redeem the repentant, to, to redeem those in Israel who trust in him, who follow him, who hear the gospel, right, who have faith in him. And we'll see that again tonight as this chapter sums up this section. It will uh, it'll talk about the condemnation of Israel as they were at the time Isaiah was prophesying and their sins. It will also talk about the mercy of God to, to, to deal with their sins if they repent, if they would uh, humble themselves, if they have a broken heart and soul, if they would trust Him, they would follow Him. The last chapter we dealt with the Sabbath, remember? And so those who kept the Sabbath and those who uh, held the covenant, God would grant them a place in the kingdom. He would grant them mercy. And so this section is, is talking about the mercy given to Israel. Okay, Isaiah 56 then. Let's start in verse 9, where we left off. Verse 8 says, The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. And of course that speaks to not only Jews and, but Gentiles, uh, not only uh, those Jews in Judah, but also in Israel. So it's the whole nation comes together. 
Uh, people read that verse and they say, well, there it is right there. That's the body of Christ, right? Jews and Gentiles all together. Well, no, this verse requires Israel be gathered first and then the Gentiles. And so it's in line with prophecy and covenants. There's no mystery here. Uh, and there's definitely no body of Christ here. It says he's gathering the outcast of Israel. There is no Israel in the body of Christ. You understand? The body of Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. And so he says, he's gathering the outcasts of Israel. Where is he gathering them? To the land. And he says, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. So see, those that are gathered are Israel. Then he gathers others, right? Uh, the mystery in this dispensation is that when Israel has fallen spiritually, so Israel's not gathered to God, we have Gentiles that can be saved. Well, how is that possible when this verse says, when he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he gathers others? So remember that, just to repeat from last week. Verse 9 then says, All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. This section, these last three verses of this chapter, deal with the blind watchmen of Israel. It talks about how the Lord will gather Israel together and bring salvation, and He'll bring it to a mountain. I think it was in verse, oh, was it verse 6 or 7 there where it talked about the mountain? Yes, verse 7. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain. We'll see that mountain come up again tonight twice. Okay. But He'll bring them to the mountain. So he, uh, the Lord gathers His people, Israel. He brings salvation to a mountain, but not under the shepherds He's about to describe. The one who will do that will be the righteous shepherd, as Jeremiah will talk about, right? But here he says these watchmen, these shepherds are supposed to be watching these, these sheep here. They're blind. So these shepherds, they're not bringing salvation. So it's a condemnation of the shepherds that were then and telling them it's not now. This kingdom I've been talking about here, it's not happening right now. Okay? Meaning in that context. Now, if you look at 2 Kings 21, what we can remind ourselves of, since we've been so much going back and forth between this section in Isaiah and Jesus' earthly ministry, talking about this, this mountain, this holy hill where there will be a, a kingdom. And we've been referencing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and how these prophecies speak of this coming kingdom, and speak of the glory there, and how this will be God's rest and His Sabbath, and, and that's going to be their conclusion. Uh, we can't forget the historical context of Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah prophesied during the times of Isaiah, Hezekiah, Ahaz, right? And uh, some would think, and this verse is maybe evidence of that, during at least the beginning part of Manasseh's reign. Uh, Manasseh was Hezekiah's son. So you have Ahaz, if you remember. He was the one that disobeyed God through Isaiah. He would not heed Isaiah's prophecies. But he was the one Isaiah warned to listen to the Lord that the Assyrians wouldn't take over Israel. <clears throat> He's the one that Isaiah gave the prophecy of the virgin shall conceive. And then after Ahaz, you had Hezekiah. Prophecies about him uh, were talking about a savior that would come and that would deliver the city. And during his reign, remember, the angel of the Lord delivered them from the Assyrians. And so Hezekiah is that righteous king that we studied. Hezekiah's son would be Manasseh. Okay? And Manasseh was wicked, not like his father Hezekiah. And so Isaiah's life spanned here. Some think maybe a little bit Manasseh. In fact, legend has it, uh, there's not a verse that says it, unless you want to take Hebrews 11, that Manasseh killed Isaiah. Okay, which could be, could be true. Uh, if you look at 2 Kings chapter 21, <clears throat> we go back into the history of Manasseh. 2 Kings 21. And I want to read this section so that you can get this in your mind. So as we're reading Isaiah 57, you can see the similarities here. Because Isaiah is going to speak about people shepherding or watching over Israel and speak about the condition of Israel and what's happening in Israel and condemning them for their sins. And you'll see them show up in Manasseh's description of Manasseh's reign, okay, which would fit perfectly with what Isaiah is saying. 2 Kings 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hebzibah. We'll see that come up later in Isaiah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen. <clears throat> So he did evil according to the pagans, the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now, who did he cast out before the children of Israel? Canaanites. And they were wicked. You can go back and read about the Canaanites, see what they did. There's a reason why God cleared the land out. He didn't want any sort of that pollution among his people. Verse 3, what did he do? He built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. Hezekiah was righteous and destroyed them. He rebuilt them. He reared up altars for Baal made a grove of trees, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. 
Ahab was not the most righteous king. In fact, he was a wicked king, a terribly wicked one. And so when he's comparing Manasseh to Ahab, not good. So we see an extreme reversal here, Hezekiah to Manasseh. He says he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. That's not God. No. Right? It's interesting that he says the host of heaven because in other places it talks about their idols and false gods and their gods. It's their gods and goddesses. Here it calls them the host of heaven. People wonder about uh, supernatural uh, uh, occurrences in other religions or different belief systems. They say, well, there's supernatural things happening there. Right? Well, well, there are hosts of heaven. There are angels. And the Bible teaches uh, fallen angels behind a lot of false teachings and religions. Yeah. So, you know, what about that supernatural being or extraterrestrial being? Or, well, there are a lot of fallen angels that create false teachings and beliefs. When people serve and worship the host of heaven and not the one who created heaven, you have a problem. And that's what's going on here. Verse 4, he built altars in the house of the Lord. So it wasn't just somewhere else. It was in God's house of which the Lord said, in Jerusalem will I put my name. Well, that's a, that's a direct affront. Right, and, and he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire, which means he killed him, right? In offering to one of these gods and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Like he did it on purpose. Like God said, uh, apparently he's going to judge us. During his father's reign, did God do that? No. There was peace after the Assyrians left, right? And so you have here uh, a rebellious son who thinks God's not going to do anything, right? In fact, in Hezekiah's life, the only intervention apart from the, the son was the angel of the Lord that one day. So you have one day and a few hours of God's intervention during Hezekiah's kingship. So, I mean, we read it and those stuck out as, wow, isn't that amazing what God did? One night, which no one saw the night, one night and a few hours in the day. That was the record of the miracles in the King Hezekiah in the, in the book of Isaiah. Right? And there were others uh, in, in the prophets. But you have Isaiah, uh, or his son rather, being rebellious to God and, and trying to provoke him to anger. He set a graven image of the grove that he had made in his house. Groves in the Old Testament refer to trees, of course, typically evergreen trees, uh, which pagans used in their worship because the evergreen tree would never die. Right? So it's this idea of eternality in the, in the evergreen tree. Uh, Christians have usurped that type of idea and tried to use it for Christ and that he gives eternal life and we have evergreen tree to eternal life. Well, that, that was originated in, in paganism. Uh, God never told Israel to do anything with trees like that. Um, and can you speak spiritually about something like that? Well, yeah, I suppose, but that's not what God instructed at all. Pagans, however, did it most often. And so you have here these groves created. And you see that, that now even today where you know, evergreen trees and pine trees and things will be built up around, say, like a statue of Mary or uh, used in different worship services. Yeah. Okay. So in different religions. In verse, uh, we're in verse 7. Yep. He's, he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, I put my name forever. So again, this provoking the Lord to anger. If you drop down to verse oh, 11. Uh, nope, I don't want that at all. I want uh, down to verse 16. Moreover, <laughs> if that's not wicked enough, moreover Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. The rest of the Acts of Manasseh are written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So he had, he instituted false worship and idolatry. He, he rebuilt the altars and rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah destroyed. He reinstituted pagan worship, worship of the angels. He saw in here witchcraft enchantments, wizard spirits, trying to provoke him to anger on purpose. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't like, well, I'm going to take our God and with the other gods. It's that he took God's house and said, it's not yours anymore. Right? And started using it for false idol worship. Let's go back to Isaiah 56. If you recognize that is the time in which Isaiah is prophesying, right? Hezekiah dies, Manasseh's reign here. You can see why he's talking about the blind watchman. Right? We can speak prophetically in that when Jesus came, he said the same thing. The blind leading the blind. Now, those who had ears to hear would have heard, if the blind are leading the blind, that means the kingdom's not coming to them. As Isaiah 56 said, he'll bring his kingdom, he'll gather them together, but not with these blind watchmen. Right? 
So they're not getting in. Jesus talked about that. But in Isaiah's day, he's saying Manasseh is not the one that's going to bring salvation here. Now, that, that's interesting historically because Hezekiah looked like a pretty good savior, right? He wasn't God, but he was doing pretty well. And so Manasseh, his son, reminder, not going to be this guy. Not coming right now. There's judgment happening. So back to Isaiah 56, verse 9. It says, all ye beasts of the field come to devour, ye, uh, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. God's judgment upon this city in part has to do with the animals, the beasts of the field coming to destroy and eat the city. You say, well, that's spiritual language. The beast may represent other armies or something or, you know, angry men. Uh, or it could just be beasts because Leviticus 26, 22 through 33, part of the covenant was, if you break my covenant and that covenant punishment aligns with this time in Israel's history, he'll bring wild beasts that will eat their children and that will destroy their land. So they won't be protected by nature, right? You see that in the, the kings where you had wild beasts come out uh, when Elisha was mocked and they tore up the children there, right? So you see that, but also here where he's calling upon the beast to come and devour this city. It's invoking the covenant of punishment, right? Jeremiah 15, verse 3, you see a similar thing in Jeremiah where Jeremiah prophesies about the punishment that will come. And we've covered this before in Isaiah, so we won't spend too much time on it. But he prophesies that the beast will come and destroy the city. And the beasts are part of this fourfold punishment. Jeremiah 15, verse 3, I will appoint over them four kinds, four kinds of destruction here. The sword to slay the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. Dogs, fowls, beasts, right? And the sword. If you go to Revelation 6, I'll let you do that on your own time. You'll find the same four things in Revelation 6. When there's wrath being poured out in Jerusalem on the earth, there's these four kinds of destruction. It has to do with God's judgment. So he says, calls to the beasts of the field to come and devour. That's not just flowery language. It could be quite literal, according to the covenant. He says in verse 10 he's doing this because his watchmen are blind, the watchmen of the city, God's watchmen that are supposed to watch, the shepherds that he has. Of all the prophets, Jeremiah speaks most about the wicked shepherds. Jeremiah prophesied at the time, about the time of Israel's fall. So Isaiah's prophesying about these blind shepherds, these blind watchmen, a generation and two before Jeremiah. Right. <clears throat> he says the watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant. That's what he says. The duty of watchmen, by the way, are to watch the sheep and protect them from the wolves, from the bears and the lions, right? Yeah. And so what happens if they're not watching? Wild beasts come and eat and destroy, right? And so you remember this in Jesus' earthly ministry when he, he was talking and using this language. So again, those who have ears to hear, you, you, these last few chapters, you, you have seen all the connections we've made to Matthew, Luke, and John, Jesus' ministry, and how everything he says is prophesied back here. Isaiah is just rich with a lot of Jesus' words. And uh, you'll see it more so tonight. All of these things in Isaiah 57, Jesus uses in his ministry. Paul even quotes one or two, and we'll get to there. A little bit. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You should know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? That whole bearing fruit issue that in teaching that Jesus had, had to do with the shepherds. How do you identify the wolf from the sheep? How do you identify a good shepherd and a bad shepherd? You know them by their fruit. Well, he's the shepherd, even though he's sinning. Not a good shepherd. He's a shepherd, even though he's blind and ignorant. Not a good shepherd, right? He's a good, he's a good shepherd. He lets everybody in. Not a good shepherd, Right? And so you'll know them by their fruits is what Jesus teaches there. And this was language referring back to Isaiah and the covenant. In Acts 20, 31, Paul even warns the Ephesian elders about uh, ravening wolves and those will come in. So those who are supposed to watch over these people is what this, these watchmen are. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. Now this is a definition. We get a definition of what it means to be blind. So when Jesus says the blind are leading the blind, and he means spiritually because they're not actually blind with their eyes, right? Um, he says in verse 10, in Isaiah 56, a definition of this. It's a very good definition here. What does it mean to be spiritually blind? They're ignorant, right? So it means they're ignorant, they're dumb. They're all dumb dogs. Dumb isn't an insult like you're an idiot. It's dumb as in you can't talk. Dogs are supposed to bark when there's trouble. You do it today, people buy dogs out in the country to warn of intruders, right, trespassers. 
If the dog doesn't bark, what's the point? Right? So there's a dog supposed to bark when someone comes to the property. He just lays there. You dumb dog. Right? You've maybe said that before. Well, the word dumb means you, don't, you can't speak out of your mouth. And so you're literally talking about this, mount, this dog that didn't bark. Right? So these blind watchmen are ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. You see the definition there of dumb? They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. And so these shepherds are not warning anybody. They're not awake. They're not standing, which means they're laying down. That's what it said there. Right? And they love to slumber, which means they love closing their eyes. So you say, well, I like to sleep. I like to sleep too. That's not the issue here. The issue is they're closing their eyes. Yeah. They're not watching. They're supposed to watch, right? Yeah. So if you love to slumber, even when you're supposed to be watching, that's the problem. And so this is why the, the, this, is, this is wrong here. So there's a great definition of this verse. If you want to circle it and say, that's what blind means. And that's what Jesus meant when he called them blind. Right? Even today, you call pastors and preachers blind, or you call people blind to the truth. Right? Well, they're ignorant. They can't, under, uh, they, they can't warn. They're closing their eyes. They're not watching and looking. They're not discerning. They don't have eyes to discern. Right? We need to have spiritual eyes that can discern right and wrong, truth from error. Right? True, true uh, uh, good shepherds and bad shepherds, if you will. Right? Good leaders, bad leaders, the saved and the unsaved. God's word gives that sort of light. Okay, so there's the understanding there. Matthew 15, 14, like I said, Jesus gives the double condemnation of the blind leading the blind in his earthly ministry. And he doesn't make that up. That's not unique with him. He's quoting the Old Testament. Right? And you get the definition right here. So, Matthew, or Isaiah 56, rather, verse 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. So not only are they blind and ignorant and dumb, they're greedy, which can never have enough. Now, this is also bad as a shepherd because if the shepherd's greedy, and the sheep aren't giving the shepherd what he wants. I mean, he's just going to let him go. You see, the shepherd's supposed to, aren't they? Are they supposed to have the sheep's best interest in mind? Right? That's the idea, protecting them. So there's going to be a little sacrifice of yourself toward them. If you're greedy, this is an issue. So again, spiritual application. We're not Israel. We don't have appointed priest over something like this. But when you see, say, a leader being greedy for themselves, that's not good. Because that's not leading, that's taking, you see. And that's, that's not a good thing at all. They are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. So why are you teaching? Why, are you, why do you want to start a group? Why do you want to lead? Why are you trying to go to the seminary so you can have an authority over other people so that you can get something? Like, not the right motivation. Was it spiritual application? Here in Israel, they were greedy in that the system was set up in Israel to collect tithes. Like, it, that was the law. You might have heard me say preachers are greedy as if that's a, a wrong thing to give money or something. But that's not the issue. The issue is under Israel, they were supposed to tithe, right? And so it would be very easy to collect the tithe and not do with it what God said behind closed doors, which is what they were doing, right? Or taking from people which the law allowed mercy for. Right? This also happens. I think I brought up Robin Hood last week or a couple weeks ago, right? And this is the idea in the, in the Robin Hood, the real Robin Hood story, was that you know, the, those in authority to collect taxes were taking taxes of people, with, apart from giving mercy to those who couldn't afford it. Right? And this is an issue. But in Israel, well, sorry, it's the law. You've got to pay up. You know? And they, they, they oppress people in that regard. So in verse 11, uh, they were greedy dogs. Right? Greed is defined in this verse then. What does greed mean? They can never have enough, right? They all look to their own way. They're one, uh, everyone for his, his gain from his quarter. That's greed. How do you combat greed? You say, well, aren't, aren't we all self-interested? Well, yeah. Well, we all should look out for ourselves, but not only for ourselves, all the time, right? This is the idea. And so it's, here it's everyone for his gain from his quarter. I'm going to seek mine, myself, nothing else. The... the the antidote to greed is giving, grace. More blessed to give than to receive is what Jesus said to, to Paul. And grace or giving without expectation of return, you saying I'm going to stop getting and taking and start giving, that's the antidote to that. Greed can never have enough. It's not greed when you say I have stuff, I, I have enough stuff, I'm going to give this away. Right? That's, the, uh, that's what mitigates greed in yourself. Okay? Uh, your flesh when it's tempted to get a little bit more, 
Never having enough. That's greed. That's the seed of greed, right? So we have some good definitions in this passage here. Uh, a condemnation of Israel and their leaders. Uh, it says in verse 12, or verse 11, that word shepherds, they are shepherds that cannot understand. It uses the word shepherds in contrast here because shepherds need to understand what's going on. They need to look to the way of others. They need to look to not their own gain, but the other's gain, right? Their protection. Verse 12 says, Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. Right? So there's nothing but glory happening here. There's nothing but merry happening here, eating and drinking and, and, and merriness, which Solomon says that's the only thing in life that's worth enjoying, is eat, drink, and be merry. Of course, that's vanity, right? It's also not charity, which is why Solomon ends up saying that's vain too, because it's all about yourself. Jesus came and taught something like that, didn't he? When he talked about the man who said, I have, an, uh, I have my barns full, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Well, if you have the barns full, the teaching of Jesus and Paul was you should give it away, right? Having it for yourself and never having enough and saying it's all for my indulgence is greed, okay? And so Luke chapter 12, Jesus warns against that and says that that sort of greed uh, disqualifies you from the kingdom, Right? Now, Jesus, of course, told them to sell everything they had. So that, that, that's a type of greed that gets to the root, isn't it? He's like, look, you have to trust me to provide everything that you need. Christians who fail to rightly divide think that's their instruction, and it doesn't work out for them. Because in this dispensation, Christ told our, our apostle, provide for yourself and for your family, right, and not be greedy. So, see, there's, there's a level to what you need and have enough. And um, Paul talks about taking care of our, our own and providing for those that, that need. Uh, Jesus said, sell everything you have. And Jesus will provide for their needs. Luke chapter 12, the account here in verse 42 is where I want to go. The Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Who is the faithful and wise steward? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. The wise steward. Of truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. So this is very clear. When Christ comes back and finds a faithful steward over the things that he has, he'll give him more. If he's unfaithful of what he has, right? Uh, he'll, he'll take away. But if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day that when he looks not for him, in an hour when he is not where and will cut him asunder and will point him his portion with the unbelievers. Now that's serious. This isn't like he'll come and rebuke you, you'll get a lesser part in the kingdom or something like that. This is like you're gone. If when I come back, you are not holding covenant, not keeping Sabbath, you're going, well, he's not going to be here for another few years, Egypt will be merry, right? You're getting cut off. No kingdom, just like the unbelievers. That's significant. This is not the gospel of the grace of God here. This is how God operates in this dispensation. He's not cutting off body parts. If when Christ comes in the rapture, he finds you, and on that day you're sinning, God forbid, right? You're in the body of Christ. Here, he comes back, that's judgment day. That's the day of atonement. We talked about that earlier. You know, when that day of atonement happens, that's the judgment. So, Luke 12, uh, you see how this aligns with Isaiah 56. These, these shepherds are saying, let's eat, drink, be merry. That's not right to begin with. And especially in light of the, the teaching on Isaiah 56 that the Lord's going to come and bring salvation. Luke 12, I'm going to come and bring salvation, I'm going to bring the kingdom, and if I come and you, you, this is what's happening, you're not getting in. Okay. Matthew 24, 48, you see a similar thing. Before the flood, they were eating, drinking, and they didn't think anything was going to happen. Right? And so Jesus warns them of this. It's the same warning Isaiah 56. Matthew 24, 48. If that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, he shall begin to smite his fellow servants to eat and drink, uh, and with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him. And it says in verse 51, He shall appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is hell. Okay? That's what happens if he comes back and finds you not keeping covenant. Now, this is important for our chapter 57. As we end verse 56, or chapter 56, with these bad shepherds, these blind watchmen, these drunken rulers who are not looking for the day of the Lord's comeback, okay, are not going to get the kingdom. Jesus came identifying these blind leaders, and he told them, you're not getting the kingdom. 
the question that every Christian needs to, to answer and understand from Jesus' ministry is if they don't get the kingdom, who does? Right? Typically, the church's answer has been, well, they don't get it. We get it. The church gets it. But that's not what Isaiah 57 says. That's not what the scriptures say. Right? What follows Isaiah 56 is not the mystery. And so Isaiah 57 is what follows Isaiah 56. Isaiah 57 continues to describe this time in history of uh, the reign of Manasseh. The righteous perisheth, and, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. So we have here in this chapter, what we're going to see is a division. This chapter is neatly divided up into two sections. And uh, the first section identifies the wicked. And the latter section identifies those who are humble and get a kingdom. Okay, so it's Isaiah 56 says, you've got some bad leaders here. I'm going to come bring salvation, but not under these blind rulers. And when I come, I'm going to divide the wicked from the righteous. Didn't Jesus talk about that a few times? Oh, yes. He talked about split, uh, dividing the chaff from the, the wheat and uh, the, the wheat from the tares and things like that. And the faithful and unfaithful virgins and things like this. Right? All over the time, he's, he's dividing Israel. In fact, in Luke 12, 51, what did Jesus say? Think ye that I come to give peace on earth? Now, what do the prophets say about that? Would Jesus come to give peace on earth? Yes, he would. Here. Right? So Jesus says, think ye I come to give peace on earth? You got it wrong. I'm sure a few zealous ones, maybe Peter included. Oh, yes! Yes! No. He said, the teaching moment. No. I come to bring division. So get it right. The prophets speak of both. He came to bring division here. He comes to bring peace here when he comes back here, right? That's peace on earth. So the division is what we're seeing in Isaiah 57. This is why all over this chapter, you'll see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John everywhere. Because this is Jesus' ministry, if you trust that Jesus is the Messiah, which he is. Okay. So verse 1, it says, the righteous perisheth. That means they're dead. Why are the righteous dead? Didn't God covenant the righteous would not perish? This is where the righteous don't perish, over here. He came to bring division, to identify the wicked and the righteous. During Manasseh's reign, did the righteous perish? Yes, they did. Manasseh came, killed the righteous, because he was implementing, instituting wickedness as a rule. Right? It wasn't just his habit, it was the, land, the rule of the land. Right? He changed the temple and the religion and everything else. So the righteous perish, and they perish by the, wicked, the hands of the wicked. That's what, how they're dying. It's not by God's hand here. Uh, God will judge the wicked, this is the righteous being or perishing at the hands of the wicked. It says, no man layeth it to heart. They're killing the righteous and they don't care. Right? It's, it's like the signs you see that say, stay apart, and this is how we stay together. It's like, it's nonsense, it's contradictory. They're killing people, and they're, no doubt they justified killing these people because they broke their rules, their laws. They weren't on board with what was happening. Because they were righteous. That's why they weren't on board with it. They were righteous and said, it's wrong what you're doing in that temple. When you speak against God's anointed, you're dead. You see that? That's how that works. But the righteous were perishing by the hands of the wicked, and no man lays at the heart. They thought there, were, there was no problem with that, which is wicked. And merciful men are taken away. Those who had mercy don't need them. Right? None considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. They thought they were purging the nation and getting things right progressing their religion beyond the old-fashioned uh, archaisms of Orthodox Judaism. In Manasseh's day, I mean, come on. I'm not doing what my father's 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 father did. We're changing things here. The world's moving on. There's not only one way to God. Right? This is not a new idea in 2021, right? In the 21st century. It's been around for a long, long time. And so, it, they, were, they were perished by the hands of the wicked. And it says in verse 1, no one considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Why did God allow this to happen would be the question that prophets like Habakkuk ask, right? Why do you allow the wicked to do such things, right? And it, it, it talks about his long suffering in this chapter. It talks about how he will judge. The answer to Habakkuk, we studied that verse by verse, is God says, oh, I see these things. And this is why judgment's coming. In fact, God said he was working judgment out. Like he was uh, making the Babylonians rise. They're going to destroy this city. So there was a time of judgment. So any time God is not judging, as God testifies himself, it's a time of his long suffering. It provides an opportunity for repentance before judgment comes. Before the judgment, you can repent. Right? And that's what Isaiah 57 calls for these people to do, to repent. 
But it says here, that it's condemning their, their wickedness, that they don't consider that the righteous are taken away from the evil to come. These people are dead, right? They're dead, but it says they're taken away from the evil. But they're dead. Like God says, I'll give you an escape. You're dead. Wouldn't the escape be like me not dying? No, here the escape from the evil to come is dying. This is an important thing to consider here, folks, because we really as humans have an issue with this. We think, well, if someone dies, I mean, God obviously didn't do anything. And here God didn't kill the people, the wicked ones did, right? But God said no one considers that the righteous aren't dying because God's allowing them because he's against them. The righteous are dying like Jesus to be taken away from the evil to come or to prevent the evil to come, right? No, so Jesus died, we covered that already. Not because God said that's good. If God didn't like it, he would have stopped it, right? Not with Jesus. Not here either. Maybe there's another reason why God allows it. Like Paul says in Romans, you're treasuring up to yourselves riches against the day of wrath, right? You're treasuring up yourself, uh, you know, vengeance from God. And so uh, the evil to come, God will destroy the city. And these righteous ones don't live through it. You say, yeah, because they're dead. Well, the Bible teaches that death is not like the end of all you. Amen. Right? When you die, you're with the Lord. When, you're, when you die, now you're in God's righteous judgments. That's what happens. Instead of being in the unrighteous judgments of wicked Manasseh, it, him instituting as a rule wickedness. I see. So that, that's how the Bible describes it here. So there's a time where... God has intervened to stop the death when the righteous are persecuted because they're with him. Read Revelation. Read Revelation, and it shows these visions of heaven and earth, heaven and earth, right? And on the earth, just wickedness. Then it shows a vision of heaven, and he sees all these people, and he says, who are these people? And the answer, of course, is these people who, who died, were martyred in the tribulation. And they're all singing up there in glory. They were delivered from the wrath to come. Now, I just said that, and that's a phrase from Paul, isn't it? You're delivered from the wrath to come. Aren't you? People reading this verse here, they say, oh, there it is. It's a, that's a picture of the rapture there. Well, the rapture isn't prophesied here because the rapture is dependent upon the revelation of the mystery. That's why you won't find the rapture anywhere in prophecy. It's dependent on the revelation of the mystery to understand. But the idea of people dying to be or taken away to be removed from evil to come, judgment and wrath and further, further damage is throughout the scripture in Israel and in the church, this dispensation. It's a concept that God gives as a comfort, right? So I don't want to belabor the point, but that is uh, something to consider there. there the, no one's considering at that day that the righteous are taken away from evil to come. So they're being delivered from evil. Now, there was someone who taught someone to pray to lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. There was someone who taught people that if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. Because it's better for you to have, go into the kingdom with one eye than to go into hell with two. What was the communication there? Communication was, if I'm going into temptation, and this temptation of like, well, you're not going to eat and survive unless you take the mark of the beast, this temptation of you could lose your place in that kingdom, it'd be better to be delivered from evil, wouldn't it? Yeah. Deliver me from evil entirely. Well, the only way you can be delivered from evil on this planet is if you disappear. You're gone. You die. Right? There's a point where people pray for that. You may not have experienced it yet. Maybe you have, but it's like there's a time where it's like, this isn't good. There's only evil that I see. By the way, just for, for those who do suffer and struggle with that sort of position and pain in their life, it's a prayer. It's not an action. It's not you going, it's better, I'm going to kill myself. That's not it. It's a prayer. God, deliver me from this. Lead me not. That's what Jesus taught him to pray. Okay, so, and by the way, he taught his disciples to pray that. You have more grace and abundant, sufficient grace for you today. That's something else. But Jesus did say, deliver them from evil. That's what's going on here. The righteous perish and are delivered from evil. They perish, are delivered by God. Let's move on here to verse 2. He shall enter into peace. This is the righteous who died, the merciful man that died. He shall enter into peace. Who gets peace? The righteous and the merciful. Right? They shall rest in their beds. They don't lose sleep at night. If their beds are the grave, they're with God. Right? Each one walking in his uprightness. You see the walking there in uprightness? These are the righteous. These are the merciful. Right? 
You can also read into this those who are taken away from the evil to come, as we'll see later, the killing of babies, as Manasseh was doing, the innocent ones, slaughtering them, slaughtering, dashing them on the stones, what this chapter will talk about, not Psalms will talk about. And they didn't do good or evil. If you're a baby, you haven't yet done good or evil, right? And it's like, why would God allow such a thing? It's evil, it's wickedness, it needs to stop. And if you're in a position to try to stop and resist it, you should, right? And God is in a position to stop and resist it. In this day, of, in this position of grace, he's offering long suffering to a wicked world, and there's wickedness that abounds, including abortions, up to 62 million now since 1973, over 2,000 a day, right? Abortions in America alone, right? And these are babies dying. They don't know right or wrong. And this verse here, it says they're taken away from the evil to come. Right? They didn't know evil. They didn't know life on earth. They also don't know evil. Right? There's a bonus. So, uh, again, not good to kill babies. Right? But that, that, this is a, a different perspective on it. It's not an instructional perspective on it. In verse 3, it says... But draw near hither. So he identifies these righteous and merciful, how they're going to enter into peace. But draw near hither. Here, ye sons of the sorcerers, ye seed of the adulterer and the whore. Wow. That's loving language, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful to read God's love letter to us? It says, you seed of the adulterer, you son of the whore. You might, you might call people bastards, which are sons of whores. That's what that is. Or an SOB, right? All right, it's like we, there's language that is just as insulting today that people use. And this is in the Bible. Ezekiel says it worse than Isaiah does. It's just terrible, but true language. I mean, he's not just speaking here out of some sort of anger. Right? He's speaking here towards these people who are sons of sorcerers. We read in 2 Kings 21, didn't we? How he introduced enchantments and witchcraft and everything else. Like it, it, it's literal here. Right? You see to the adulterer and of the whore. Come here, I'm going to tell you something about your sins, is what he's saying. These people he's talking about here for the next 10 verses are not the seed of the promised land. They're not the seed of the righteous. They're not the righteous seed. They're not the merciful. These are the wicked. Right? So this whole chapter is dividing the wicked from the righteous, trying to help you know how to know the difference. You know them by their fruit. If they cause the righteous to perish and take away the merciful man, what's that tell you about the leader? He's wicked. What's that tell you about the man? They're wicked. You know them by their fruit. Right? Verse 3, so come here, you sons of the sorcerers, the seed of the adulterer and of the whore, against whom do you sport yourselves? Sporting yourselves. They have sport. In the Bible, it's not football and baseball. It has to do with making fun of, right? Mocking another. Who are you mocking is what he's saying. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Draw out your tongue. You're sticking your tongue out, right? Wide mouth. You're laughing. <laughs> or you're going, <laughs> mocking. Mockery. Make a wide mouth, stick out your tongue. And who do you do this against? This is a rhetorical question. They're doing it against the righteous ones, against God himself. Remember 2 Kings 21? Manasseh is provoking God to anger. This is a sacred place? I'll build a pagan altar in it. Like, he knows that the law said it was a sacred place. That's why it was listed there, the place to whom Solomon said, this is the name of the, of the, where the name of the Lord will be. He knew that. Manasseh wasn't ignorant of what the, his fathers did, he did precisely the opposite of what they did. Right? Which, that's some sort of wickedness. It's not just that you're ignorant and, oh, I didn't know that. It's, you know what was right and you, contra uh, you contradict it. You do 180 degrees. Right? So who do you draw out your tongue? Are ye not the children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Wow. A false seed. Now that, that speaks directly to the Abrahamic covenant. Because God gave Abraham a covenant that his seed would bless the nations of the world, right? Through his seed, God would bless the seed of Isaac and the seed of Jacob, the seed of Israel, right? Here, Isaiah is calling these people who are Israelites, sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying, you're a seed of falsehood. You're the wrong seed. Like, you're children of transgression. You're children of transgression, not children of righteousness. You're children of disobedience. Paul uses that language, doesn't he? Children of disobedience. Think, think ye not that you know, the, the, those things uh, are, are good, because the, those are things of children of disobedience. Those are children of unrighteousness, children of wrath. So that language that Paul uses, children of, trans of, of unrighteousness and children of wrath, it comes from Isaiah here. Children of transgression. So you can go back here for definition to define what it is to be a child of, tr of transgression and disobedience. 
yeah, that's bad. And Paul's simply saying in Ephesians 5, yeah, those are bad. That's why they don't get the kingdom. So why would you want to do them? Right? If they don't get the kingdom in this chapter because of the wickedness that God's pointing out, then why under grace would you think it's a good thing now? It's fine. No, it's terrible. Right? Just because you're saved by grace doesn't change the sin. It pays for your sin, but it doesn't change what sin is. So Paul's using language here in Ephesians 5. And we'll see this again in Ephesians. Ephesians, isn't that the book that everyone, Acts 28, Acts 2, Acts, Mid-Acts, will all agree teaches the mystery of Christ? Yes. And he's using Isaiah language. We'll see later that in, in the very section he's describing the mystery of Christ, he quotes Isaiah 57. So you can't remove yourself from the rest of Scripture. You need it all, right? It doesn't negate the mystery at all. We'll see that in a bit. But you have here, these, these people he's talking to are not the seed of promise. Uh, Paul talks about that in Romans 9, verse 8. Remember Romans 9, verse 8, where he says that uh, he's talking about who true Israel is and how Israel fell. In Romans 9, verse 8, this, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Remember? So he's talking about not just Abraham, but Isaac. Not all sons of Abraham, not all sons of Isaac, but Jacob. Not all sons of Jacob, even. It's not the children of the flesh, it's the children of promise. So it's among those Israelites that there's a promise given, but not just because you're born an Israelite do you get the promise. So in Isaiah 57, when he says, you're wicked in Israel, you're not going to get the kingdom, that's in accordance to the promise given to the fathers. But John 8, 44, Jesus came teaching this thing. What Paul says in Romans 9, 8 is not new. It's not mystery. Um, Matthew chapter, or John chapter 8, verse 44, in the famous place where Jesus speaks about the religious rulers of his day there, the Pharisees and scribes against him and says, you are of your father, the devil. Wow. What did he say back here? Isaiah called him seed of the adulterer. Yep. You're your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. He calls them sons of liars. Right? They're sons of adulterers. They're, they've broken the law. Children of transgression, they're blind. That's what the language Jesus used against those in Israel he identifies as not getting the kingdom. Using Isaiah's language in Isaiah 57. Matthew 13, 38 is another place where he, he speaks of this. So again, you see the vocabulary Jesus uses is defined in Isaiah. So when he says, if you have ears to hear, what that means is, if you know the dictionary, if you know what the prophets defined these terms as, I am now labeling who these people are. Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world, the good seed. The what seed? The good seed. Oh, you mean there's false seed, there's bad seed? Yeah, there's bad seed too. So the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares, wouldn't that be the bad seed? Are the children of the wicked one. You see? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Here's the end of the world. There's going to be reapers here, and there's a whole seed, a field planted with seed. And the complaint is, hey, there's wicked people among those. There's tares among that wheat. He goes, yeah, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the bad seed are going to be ripped out. When does that happen? Not in this dispensation. Jesus wasn't talking about the church today. Is that what happens today in the church? We're separating the wheat from the chaff? Only the best get into the church building. No, that's not what we're doing. Because if we were, we'd have to be slaughtering the other people. That's what the kingdom would do. Right? That hasn't happened yet, separating the tares from the wheat. Isaiah 57 identifies a false seed, as Jesus was. Okay. In verse 5, inflaming yourselves... Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree. The inflaming yourselves has to do with their passions being inflamed, okay? With idols. Uh, idol worship in that day was pornographic, okay? If you ever, and I would not recommend it, this sort of study, but uh, the, the Greek god Priapus, Aphrodite, was a temple in Ephesus that Paul speaks against, right? Where they had sacred prostitution. I mean, you'd call it prostitution just because of the behavior, but it wasn't even prostitution. It was just a me means of worship. You come in, you do it, right? And that was the, the worship towards these gods because that's what they saw as bearing fruit was physical fruit. And so if you could not bear physical fruit, you are cursed of the gods. 
And so that sort of sexual activity and promiscuity um, is what pervades even society today. What was it this last couple of weeks people have been debating and arguing over the, uh, the abortion victory in Texas, right, of uh, essentially prohibiting abortions after you hear a heartbeat, which is pretty early in the pregnancy. And the response, ironically, this last week, I don't know if you heard it or not, the response from a few different pro-choice uh, uh, defenders were advocating abstinence or not having sex with your husbands or not having sex at all. They didn't say husbands. They said it at all because they, they don't do the marriage thing. It's just not having, don't allow men to have sex with you if they do not provide abortion. And it, it's just so ironic that they would promote that sort of lack of promiscuity if they don't get the abortion that they demand. That they really want the abortion. They want to be, see, and, that, and the reason I bring that up is because it shows the reason why they want abortion. Because yeah. it's for sex. Yeah. It's nothing to do with, I'm making a choice about my future life, which happens with some people, but the main motivation is we do not want to be confined to an environment in which a baby can be provided for in marriage. They're having a commitment to myself and the choices I make. No, I want to do with my body what I want, not, be, not after the conception, before the conception. I want to be promiscuous. And in order to allow me to do that without consequence, we need abortion. We need birth control. Because otherwise, that's what happens. You get birth. Right? You make babies. And so, and, and Christians have been saying that for years. They, they say it's a, it's a woman's choice it's a woman's body. Well, it takes a man to make a baby too. Like they don't, they don't get pregnant. But it's just as much the man's baby as the woman. So why is it the woman's choice if the man made the baby as well? Right? So men get, should get involved. Don't they have a say? Imagine, I mean, this only fits in the context that there is no obligation between men and women when they have these sorts of intercourses. But in a marriage relationship, if the woman gets pregnant and she goes, you know what? It's my choice. You go, what about your husband? Well, it's my choice. What to do with this kid? Just yours? Like, there's not another parent? It just doesn't make sense in the confines of marriage. But this is the argument. But Isaiah 57 speaking about this idea. Inflaming yourselves with idols. This is their idolatry. And the idols they would speak of. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah goes into more detail. This chapter dealing with these uh, false shepherds and the idolatry, Jeremiah really uh, speaks specifically to because he's prophesying during the day of this debauchery. And Jeremiah 7 speaks about these false gods. These false gods have names. Astarte. Gods that they worshipped that would die during the winter and resurrect in the spring. And so they would worship them with fertility symbols in the spring. It happens to be around the same time as Easter, but we all know Easter's not that. Right. Jeremiah 7 Verse 18. There's a reason why they have holidays at certain days of the year uh, and, and celebrate it in a certain way. Yeah. Jeremiah 7, 18. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. This, Jeremiah is prophesying about the fall of Jerusalem and this is what they're doing. They're offering cakes to the queen of heaven. Roman Catholics make Mary the Queen of Heaven. The Bible describes, not Mary, who's yet future, but the Queen of Heaven being Ishtar on a star day. Right? And these are names in your Bible, yeah. given to the gods that they're worshiping. Okay. They would, those gods, by the way, would be translated into different cultures because they go from the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Greeks to the Romans, and they, just give, they change the names. Same gods and festivals, they change the names. This is what happens in every pagan culture which is just telling when it comes to history. Because after the Romans, you get what? Christians in the West? Same festivals, different names. Right? And so you have this continuation in history. This is what happens every time. And so you have Thursday, the worshiping of God of Thor. Wednesday, which comes from the Norse god Odin, Odin's Day or Woden's Day. Friday, which in the Romantic languages, you can see very clearly, Vendredi in French and in Latin comes from the god Venus. Or the Norse god Freya. Either way, that's how you get the English Friday. But god Venus, which goes back to Aphrodite and goes back. It's the same type of female goddess that goes through all these mythologies. Right? Jeremiah chapter 10 in verse 14 
Same people Jeremiah is talking about here. Israel worshiping false gods. Jeremiah 10, verse 3. It says, The customs of the people are vain. The customs of the people are vain because they're following the heathen. In verse 2, one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails, with hammers that move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. They cannot move. So they have to be stood up with nails. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. These are false idols, false gods. And then it says in, down in verse uh, uh, 9 and 10, They are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates to br uh, uh, is brought from Tarshish and gold from Mufaz, the work of the workmen. It's all man's possessions, silvery, shiny things. Verse 10, The Lord is the true God. He is living God. And, uh, and so it's describing here their idolatry worship with these trees they take out of the forest, these evergreen trees, right? And what they do is they deck them out, right? These evergreen trees are part of their worship ceremonies. And these trees would bring them blessing and they would be merry around them. I mean, literally, the, the merry were reading about the drunkenness and the eat and drink because it's an abundance. They do that around the trees. They do it around this worship grove that they create. That's why they build the groves in the Old Testament. They build a grove. What's the grove for? The worship. What's the worship? It's merriness, which includes libations, drink offerings, and sacrifices, food offerings. And you do it around these trees. It's nothing to do with Christmas. Right? Like, it's just, it blows your mind. Like, that's what they were doing in Jeremiah. We do, it for, do it for, we do it for a different reason. You do what? The same thing. For a different reason. It's the same thing. See, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the reason that's really the problem. It's the, what you're doing. Right? The end never justifies the means. Right? So it's a different reason. So God, did, did God tell you to do that is the question. Now, Jeremiah 10 is not Christmas, of course. There was no Christmas in Jeremiah 10. These are false gods. Okay? Isaiah 56, verse, uh, verse, or 57, verse 6, rather. They're inflaming themselves with idols under every green tree, which is where they would worship, but also practice their... Debauchery. This is what you find in pagan religion. They confuse the sacred with the profane. So much so that what they consider sacred is the profane. That's sacred. You can't touch that because that's our sacred thing. You can't touch LGBTQ. Don't you dare call someone queer, even though that's the Q in LGBTQ. Right? Or gay. Don't call someone gay. That's the G in the LGBTQ. Right? It's a sacred thing. You can't, it's profanity. It's immoral. That's what the, this is the Bible's definition of it. However much you may love a person, you may know people and friends, and you love them, and they love people, and they may be just as good as you, which is not saying you're God at all. It's the actions, it's the doings, which you have actions and doings that are wicked as well. Right? Isaiah 57 is describing their actions. It's describing what's going on under these trees. And it says, as a result of inflaming themselves under the trees, they slay the children in the valleys. Why, what, why are children coming out of these trees? Because what they're doing in the trees. So what they do in the trees produces children. What do you do with the children? If you're a sacred prostitute, you're going to have children. If your birth control didn't work, what do you do with the children? You slay them. Right? 62 million babies in America since 1973. That's what happens. Right? Babies happen, and you kill them. Because you got to keep on with what you, you worship. Right? Slay the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Why in the valleys? So people don't see them. In the cliffs of the rock. Right? Among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering that thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? So they're offering sacrifices to God. Which God? The God. Many of them. All of them. You're included, Yahweh. It's Jehovah, but you know. They include them all. Well, he says, should I be comforted in this? That as a result of your worship services, you have children that you kill. And then this is what would happen here. Pagan worship would include these smooth stones. They, a sorceress toolkit has been discovered in the ashes of Pompeii. Found a box with hinges on it. They found things inside of sorcerers. Now, didn't we read here? They're sons of sorcerers. Manasseh brought sorcery in. This is, this is millennia ago. What are they finding there? Smooth stones. Like stones smoothed out. They, they use them for dyes and different like, prognostications and whatever. 
They use them in their worship. Big smooth stones. Over there in Mecca is a giant black smooth rock, which they worship. Right, they bat onto it. It represents Allah. Smooth stones, giant smooth ones, were used in pagan worship, which is why in Israel God told them when you build an altar, do not smooth it and polish it. And you say, why would God say that? Remember that? The law in Deuteronomy said, don't make a hewn stone. Like, when you build an altar, don't use a stone that you're going, shh, shh, shh. Now, look at that, that's really nice. We'll put a little flourish there. Nope. You take a rock just from the core, you just take it and just set it there. It's kind of raw, isn't it? He goes, yep. Because it's not about the altar, it's about what's on it. Right? There's a lesson in there somewhere. Christians use crosses everywhere, right? It's not about the actual cross, is it? It's who died on it. Don't worship the cross. We preach the cross as meaning Jesus dying on it and raising from the dead. But it wasn't about the altar. It's never about the altar. It's the sacrifice you, you shed on it, right? And so he says it's against the Jewish law to build your altar out of hewn stones, which means you're going to polish that thing. I mean, it's, it, after all, it's for the sacred place, right? We came into the church building here where I'm standing right here. We have a stage, but I didn't want to stand up there because I wanted to see you closer. But where I'm standing was a table, nice and smooth and polished, you're in remembrance of thee. And it's like, religions have such things. You make nice things, polished and smooth. And so, where would, where would they get these smooth stones? Naturally, they'd be smoothed down in the, the rivers and where water runs over them. They'd be naturally smooth. They could also smooth them out themselves. That's naturally where they're at. But what else are they doing in these same rivers where there's smooth stones? They're killing their babies. Like, that's the sacred and profane mixture again. And so what you see, look at Isaiah 13, verse 16. <clears throat> Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 is the burden of Babylon, right? The Babylon is, is, is talking about the sins of Babylon. Now, by the time Jer uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah are prophesying of the sins of Israel and Jerusalem, they have incorporated the worship of the pagans, the heathens, the Assyrians, the Babylonians into what they do. So if you read the sins of the Babylonians, it's just like reading the sins of Jerusalem in Isaiah 57. Because they're worshiping the gods of the heathen, right? Isaiah 13, it says in verse 16, <clears throat> Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Now this is God's judgment against them because they did those things. In Psalm 1 and 37, it says the same thing. In Psalm 137, it's a psalm thinking about what the Babylonians did to Jerusalem and how these Jews are said, sing a happy song, sing a Jewish song. And they said, how can we when we remember what you did to us and what was part of your religion in our society, which was children being dashed on the stones? That's what Psalm 137 says. Like, why were they dashed on the stones? It was to kill them. But here's the really sick part. It was part of their worship. They would offer the children. They would pass their son through the fire, and they would, it's their altar. The smooth stone was their altar. They put the baby, there you go, to you, God of fertility, that allows us such pleasure. Right? We give this fruit of our bodies to you. It's wicked. Right? Oh, no, worry. life doesn't really begin until you start to talk. You know. No, that's, that's wrong. That's wicked. It does begin at conception. Amen. It's a new body, a new person. Isaiah 57, verse 7. I only make these connections to modern culture to show that <clears throat> sins are the same. <laughs> and wickedness, people left to their own devices are the same. And that's what God has done today. He's left people to their own devices, offering them grace. And that's the difference between this, Isaiah 57, and us today. There's a message God's communicating of grace and salvation today to people. During this time, God's just saying, I'm, I'm giving you a chance to repent. Today he's given everyone a chance for salvation. Amen. Right? Isaiah 57, verse 7, Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even there wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also and the post hast thou set up a remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me, and art gone up. Thou hast enlarged thy bed. There's more people in your bed than needs to be. That's not good, right? You enlarge your bed and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed where thou sawest it. Wherever it's at, you're going to go. Right? You've got these groves up there on a lofty and high mountain. You have, remember up in uh, 2 Kings 21, he built the, the altars in high places? They're on the mountains. What's supposed to be on the mountain? 
In Isaiah 56, remember? He says, I'll give you a place in my, my mountain, my high mountain, my holy mountain, in his kingdom. What's supposed to be on the mountain is a righteous kingdom. And instead, what's on the mountains? Killing their children, right? Their typical prostitution, worshiping other gods, that's what defines their civilization and their city. That's what Jerusalem is, where God's name was supposed to be, right? And so you have them in verse 6. I didn't finish the verse there. They're on the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They that are thy lot given to them hast thou poured a drink offering and hast offered a meat offering. You know, they're, they're offering offerings here on these stones, okay? Harold, give me a note on Sunday, which I will now repeat to you, that the only other place in your King James Bible that has smooth stones in it, that uses the words smooth stones, is in Samuel, talking about David. We picked up the smooth stones from the water, right? To go and killed Goliath with it, right? Well, he hit him in the head with it, knocked him down. Those smooth stones. He took smooth stones from the water, the very stones that people would use for false worship and to dash children with, and he slaughtered the giant. There's something to that, right? So this is, that's how God's going to judge, just like at Psalm 137. It's like David, he'll use their altars against them, right, and, and kill them that way. But anyway, in Isaiah 57, in verse 8, it says, Behind the doors also in the posts hast thou set up a remembrance. On the doorposts of Israel's houses, God mandated under the law that they put a, a statement of the law. Okay? You, you see in Jewish houses, even apartments, things now, you'll see on their doorposts, you walk up to a, 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 a diagonal uh, ornament here. It looks like this. I think I have it the wrong direction, actually. Um, where they put scripture in there, according to their law. Right? To, because that's what God commanded. Yeah. It was written words. Here, instead, they are putting on their doors and posts the remembrance of their false idols and their images, graven images. So the law forbid this, but they're putting pictures. Replace the words with pictures and worship that. Like, nobody does this, right? But there are pictures of Mary and there's pictures of, you know, yeah, people do that all the time. And in other religions as well. The pictures are beautiful. Why doesn't the God of Israel like pictures? Right? People tend to worship them. That's why. You know, it's not that pictures aren't beautiful, but they're made from man. What's more beautiful than a picture of a person is the actual person. What's more beautiful than a picture of a landscape is the actual landscape. Right? So the issue has to do with false worship. And what you're, what you're setting up as this idol here. But you have here on the doors and the posts, not what God said to do to remember, but what they're trying to remember. In verse 9, thou wentest to the king with anointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers as far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. You see that? So they're putting on the perfume and the ointment to serve the, the king and the prostitutes and the priests of their religion, which are pagan religions, remember, not of God. And because of that, they're debasing thyself even unto hell by participating in this religious worship service. We're in a strange country. As it, when in Rome, do as the Romans, they say. That leads you to hell. But that's what they did. We're in Babylon, do what they say. Or, you know, they're coming around us. Why not incorporate them? We want to make them feel welcome. Or we want protection from other countries. We've seen that before in Isaiah. In the, in, in the, the ancient world, to get protection from other countries, you'd have to trade. And part of that was trading religion. And so you'd put a statue of their God in your temple, and then they would offer you protection. Because their God now is in your land. Right? And if they did that, that showed their infidelity to the God of Israel. We covered that in Hezekiah, remember. Hezekiah did not do that. And that small city defeated the Assyrians. Right. So Isaiah 57, verse 9, you have this, this issue here. In verse 10, thou art wearied in, thy, in the greatness of thy way. So you, in your way, which does not bring you peace, right? You are wearied. Life is tough, Right? All this worship and all these things we have to do. Yet, saidst thou not, there is no hope. Now, th this is interesting. You have to think about what he's talking to here. He's talking about these wicked ones who are doing these wicked things. And he, he says, though you're tired and weary, you're not saying there's no hope. Instead, you say there is hope. Thou hast found the life of thine hand, therefore thou wast not grieved. These people doing wickedness are not grieved because they find a benefit to it. They think that they are succeeding. They're making progress. There is hope. I see going to a good direction. The world talks like this, right? There is hope. Not in Jesus. Not in God. There's hope. We can do it. We can get through this. We can make it by our own, the works of our own hands. Well, 
There's a lot of wickedness around. No, no, no. Don't talk about sin, you religious bigot. We can fix it. We're people. Believe in humanity. This is the religion even today. That's what that's saying. You never said there's no hope because even though you were tired of the work and you saw the problems were always there, because you did not worship me, is what he's saying. What God's wanting is people to realize there is no hope outside of him. That's what God wants. And we'll see later in this chapter, if they get to that point where they realize that their soul is just, uh, there's no hope without the Lord. That's where he gives mercy. But not when they're going, oh, we got it. We got it. We don't need him. Mock, mock. Right? God is not mocked, Galatians 5 says, as of the Old Testament. Isaiah 57, verse 11. Of whom hast thou been af afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me? They haven't been afraid at all. Why not? They've been at peace, relatively speaking, as far as God has not judged them yet. Right? So they're not afraid of God. There's no fear of God in their eyes, Romans chapter 3 says. Right? It says, You have not laid it to heart. Have not I held my peace even of old, and thou fearest me not? Now, that's an interesting question. God says, why don't you fear me? I've held my peace. Why don't you fear me? I have not come and judged you. You should fear the day of judgment. Yeah. And God's saying you should fear it because I can do it and I haven't yet. Right? See, what, what the Bible teaches and what God's saying here is that every day I don't judge sinners is a day of long suffering, a day of opportunity for you to repent. But men don't see it that way. Men see every day God doesn't intervene to stop what they think he should stop is a day of God's neglect, right? So every day to the wicked is another day against God. To the righteous, even this is sensation, as we know what God's doing, every day is a day of opportunity of God's grace. So it's a testimony of, what, of, of God is great. Romans 2 talks like this, says, know you not about God's long suffering. Well, how would they learn about long, God's long suffering? From the Old Testament. How long did he allow you to exist before his judgment? But men don't see it that way. Why didn't he intervene sooner if he was real, if he cared? Well, wouldn't your care prolong the suffering, like his long suffering? Because you are offending him, right? So he held his peace is what he says. He had been silent. He had been silent, and judgment was going to come, right? Um, There's a silent God here. There's judgment. God is silent here. There's a similarity. People can read that and say, that sounds like the dispensation of grace. That God has not intervened to judge. It's true. Prophecies talk about God's not intervening to judge in the Old Testament and before His judgment comes in Revelation. His not intervening to judge is different than Him revealing something that gives you a privileged position. So it's not his, simply his non-intervention to judge that is the dispensation of grace. It's that in combination with he has dispensed a new body he's creating. That's the dispensation of grace. Right? So yes, his long suffering, yes, plus he's given you something you don't deserve. That's grace, right? Giving you something you don't deserve, which includes long suffering. But. So you see, you get a similarity. People want to make that today, and it's, it's not, but... Move on to verse 13 here. Isaiah 57, verse 13. When thou criest, now he's identified the wicked, now he's going to identify the righteous. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee. The companies of what? The, the soldiers, the armies of what? The false gods you've accumulated. Right? When you cry out for help, when you get to that point where your soul finally is broken, then let your gods help you out. Now he's, he's, he's writing a little mockery of himself. He's done this before. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee. But the wind shall carry them all away, and vanity shall take them. We've, we've seen that before in Isaiah, where he mocks how they fall down, and someone else has to pick them up, right? And he says, vanity shall take them. But he that puts his trust in me shall possess the land, and shall inherit my holy mountain. That's a very clear statement. After ten verses of wickedness, and you are not going to care about me, and thus you're going to get judgment. He says here, those that trust in me will possess the land and inherit my holy mountain. This is the land. This is the holy mountain. This is the goal of Isaiah 57. Right? And he's saying you got to trust. What's the condition? Trust. If I wanted to remove the word land and holy mountain or make that spiritual about heaven, 
can I say this is, talk, this is doctrine about you? I mean, trust the Lord and you'll get heaven. Well, trust in what? You've got to ask that. But also, yes, trust. Believing in God and trusting Him is a throughout the Scripture truth. Right? It's always trusting God and what He said. Where in the Bible, in any dispensation, is it trusting yourself? None. Right? That's never the truth. And so, he says, let your idols come and protect you, your gods, your heroes. They're not going to protect you. The holy mountain we've seen before in Isaiah 56, verse 7, at the beginning of the lesson, how those who take hold of the covenant and keep the Sabbath, they get a place in my holy mountain. Here, it's those that trust me get a place in my holy mountain. They're going to trust him, which means they're going to repent of what they've been doing and how they've been worshiping. Right? Those will be a day where they worship him in truth. Right? In spirit and in truth is what Jesus says. In verse 13, he starts to describe here how certain people, certain ones, will be blessed with a place in this land, a possession. They'll inherit the land. Now look at Psalm 37. This is where you put this psalm. Certain ones will be blessed. You know what you call these blessed statements? Well, you'll find out here in Psalm 37. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Why would you be envious against them? They feed their flesh and do what they want, and they don't get judged. That's why. No one's envious of the sinners on the day of judgment. Right? But it's natural in your flesh, your flesh, not in your spirit, to be envious of sinners when they seem to be getting away with it. Right? They shall soon be cut down, verse 2 says. See, that's the place of Isaiah 57. You got a bunch of wicked people here, but they're soon going to be cut down. So don't envy yourself over them. They'll wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, Isaiah 57, verse 13 says. And do good. So What? And do good? Yeah, that's what Isaiah 55, 56 said, right? Hold the covenant, keep the Sabbath. Trust in the Lord and do good. That's called faith and works. Because if you're trusting God, what did God say? Well, he told us not to worship that Ashtaroth pole. Yep. Yeah. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That's the bookmark verse. But it's right in the middle of, if you trust the Lord, he'll give you the land. Isaiah 57 says, you'll get the kingdom. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Why are they waiting for him? He's going to come back. So they're living in an evil day. They're waiting because God's not intervening yet, but he's going to come back in judgment. So they need to wait patiently for him. Right? Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise. You see the word fret show up a lot here. Don't fear that you're in the wrong place because you're being threatened with death by wicked people who seem to be in power. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Excuse me, what did it say? Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Does that sound familiar to you? If it doesn't, verse 11 will. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. A little while, they're going to be judged. Thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth. Here's the definition of meek. Now, you've heard that before, haven't you? Where else have you heard the meek inherit the earth? Matthew 5. What is a statement of blessing? A beatitude. A beatitude is the word for a blessing statement. Matthew 5 is called the beatitudes because they're statements of who gets the blessings. Isaiah 57 is dividing out who doesn't get the blessing and who does get the blessing. Psalm 37 is describing, don't envy those sinners. They're going to get their comeuppance and judgment from God. But you who trust in the Lord and do good according to God's covenants get the blessing. Right? These are the beatitudes in Psalm 37. Right? Isaiah 57, it's doing the same thing as the Beatitudes are doing. It's saying the wicked don't get in, but those that trust me, those meek, they'll inherit the land. They'll inherit the earth. Look at Matthew 5. These Beatitudes, it's not like these are good character traits you should have. Well, yeah, they are, but it's like it's describing who gets the kingdom. Where does Jesus teach this, this teaching of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5? From where? It's called the Sermon on the... Mount. You would think God had an issue with mountains or something. Like, you know, like they're doing something bad on mountains and he's trying to reclaim them or something. 
Like, he's going to try to clean up these mountains. Like, he's going to put some city on a hill or something. Like, he's going to try to shine some good light from these mountains instead of the corruption that is. Yeah, all of the above. Seeing the multitudes, he went up to a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Quoting Psalms, I'm quoting Isaiah. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, what if they threaten to kill us? Then die. You'll be delivered from the evil to come. Right? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What if they try to remove the merciful? You're blessed. That's what Jesus said, right? If the wicked persecute you, Jesus says, you're blessed in the kingdom. Now, how do you get blessing? Through Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. You have all spiritual blessings in him. It's not based on how anyone treats you, good or for bad, or, or any of your characteristics in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom here is not just a spiritual thing. It's an actual kingdom that God promised to these people he's preaching to from a mountain. He says, it's the Mount of Olives, on which he will return with his kingdom. Amen. He says, this is who's going to get this kingdom. Next time I come, here's going to get it. These people. What does the 57 teach? Here's the wicked ones. They don't get it. And here's who gets it, those who trust in me. Go back to Isaiah 57, verse 13. He that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain, and shall say, cast ye up, cast ye up, verse 14, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. When he comes back, when the Lord returns, he says, he's going to start saying, prepare the way, which is what John the Baptist said. Now, John the Baptist said, prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Here, the statement is, prepare the way for my people to come back. So there's a prepare the way here for the Lord. There's a prepare the way here, too. And the prepare the way here is spoken to the nation, saying, you open up your way so my people can come back. The righteous will return. You say, we can't combat their armies. What's Matthew 5 say? Don't worry. I'll prepare the way for you. Right? Joel talks about that. And so, uh, verse 15, thus saith the high and lofty one, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. He has eternity. That's God, whose name is holy. I'm sorry, what's his name? The holy one? Is that what it says? The one who inhabits eternity is the holy one? Who's the holy one? We've seen that many times before. In Acts 3.14, Peter calls Jesus the holy one. He claims to Israel, denied the holy one, and killed him. That's Jesus Christ. Right? So, whose name is holy. He says in verse 15, The high and holy one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. How do you dwell with God? How does God dwell with you? You have a contrite and humble spirit. What's that mean? It's, you are not high and lifted up. right? You don't have pride. If you don't, then you get to dwell with the Lord. You get the mountain. You get the kingdom. Right? Humility. Interesting. So, the dwelling with the Lord is conditioned on contrition and humility. Right? What did Matthew 18 teach? Matthew 18, his disciples come to Jesus and they say, who will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what does Jesus say? Well, if that's how you're thinking about it, you're not getting in. Right? What's he say? And Christians use this as an excuse not to study, which is just ridiculous. But they say, you've got to be like a child. Child are dumb. They're ignorant. They don't know anything. They don't have to study. Well, they, actually, they do have to study. But Jesus says, called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, unless you change your mind, guys, and realize it's not about who's the greatest, and become as little children, you should not enter the kingdom of heaven. And Christians take that and say, there you go. You have, a, you have to have a childlike faith. No, that phrase never appears in the Bible. If by childlike faith, you mean not specific, not descriptive, not precise, not pure, not doctrinally accurate, then you are wrong. That's what most people mean. Childlike faith. Don't worry about all the trivial things. Just believe in God. Which God? Doesn't matter. Childlike faith. 
No. Where's your instruction? It doesn't matter. Childlike faith. Our children learn a lot in the Sunday school, right, in the classes. Right? Children can learn. But here it's talking not about their faith. Look what it says in verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest the kingdom of heaven. The teaching is to get in. It's not about who's greatest. It's who's least. The teaching, the reason why he brought a child there is because there's no class of people on the planet lower than children. And that they are servants to children. Two people who birthed them, right? Like their parents. Like they, they serve them. They have to obey. They're not only smaller than everybody else, but it's like they obey their parents. That's the description of the commandment. Who do parents obey? God. One day children grow up and they obey God. Their parents take a different rule, right? But as children, they obey God and their parents. Humble yourself, Right? Humble yourself as this child, is what he says. That's the teaching of Isaiah 57. If you humble yourself, if you have a broken spirit, which is to say you're not saying, I'm not doing what you say, Dad. Why don't you obey? Rebellious, independent, right? And so parents need to teach their children and discipline their children to be obedient to what's right to God, ultimately. But the parents are in charge of teaching them that obedience to God. So when they get the humility of, I need to obey God, right? So their heart has been contrite to learn that. That's when you get in, right? You don't, can't get in as a rebel, an independent, you know, disobedient one. So in Isaiah 57, verse 15, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high place, and with him also. Notice it says, with him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit. With him. Now they can, you can take that two different ways. One, that with him meaning with the person, is of a contrite and humble spirit. Or you can think about who is the one, the him that did have a contrite and humble spirit. And Jesus was that. Isaiah 53 is his humiliation. Philippians 2, Jesus says, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself, put on humanity, became obedient unto death. He didn't have to, but he did. And that brought salvation. So he dwells with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. If you want to teach that Christ dwells with the Father, that's also true, right? And it's this one who has a contrite and humble spirit that revives the spirit of the humble and revives the heart of the contrite ones. You see that in the verse? So again, you can read that two different ways, both of them being true. One is that the first part's talking about Jesus, and the second part's talking about what he does revives the hearts of the others. Or just it dealing with everyone, having a humble and contrite spirit, which is also true, right? But it's through Jesus' humiliation that those with a contrite spirit get hope, right? You see that in there as well. To revive the heart of the contrite ones, the broken ones, the hopeless ones, the humble ones. They realize they can't do it on their own. They need God's help. And God's help was sent in the form of a man, right, who humbled himself to death, right? And so you have in verse 16, I will not contend forever. But I, I, can't, I can't pass up this verse without saying one more thing about this. You see in this verse here how... When people humble themselves, what do they get from God? They get the kingdom. They get peace. They get mercy. They get dwelling with Him. They get grace. You can say that. They get given to them what they can't do, what they don't deserve, because they're humble. The Bible talks about giving grace to the humble. Paul never says that about you. He gives grace towards sinners today. Yeah. You don't have to. It's, be careful what I say here. Humility is good, <laughs> contrition is good. Okay, but it's not a precondition to God's gracious abundance towards you. Okay, because humility is a work, and contrition is a work, like confessing with your mouth is a work. Today it's by faith without works. But there should be humility in you if you realize. That's why Paul says, "Don't you should condescend yourself," right? You not have that pride. Grace teaches you that, by the way, because you're a sinner. You see. But here, under the law, God gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6, James says this. God gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, says if you get persecuted for doing right, don't worry, God gives grace to the humble. Right? This idea of giving grace to the humble. Look at 2 Chronicles 33. This will, this will uh, be an interesting testimony to you, perhaps, about God giving grace to the humble. Manasseh, wicked king. Right? Wicked. The description of the false shepherds. 
In 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11, Manasseh, because of his wickedness, God sent the Babylonians to come and take him away. He was taken away in bondage and chains. And in his bondage and chains, he repented. And so he made the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err in verse 9 and verse 11. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon him the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He humbled himself. Wicked king Manasseh rebuilt the groves, instituted false worship as a rule, was punished by God here and humbled himself. And prayed to him. Now you as a man would say, that's not enough. Look at the evil you did. But he prayed to God. In fact, there was a, a, an epistle, a book, a, a small letter in, in the 1611 printing of the Bible. It's not in the 66 canonical books. It's called the Prayer of Manasseh. Right? And, and you can read it um, if you had a 1611 version of the Bible. It's in the apocryphal part. And prayed unto him. And it's, it's about Manasseh's prayer. Now whether it's authentic or not, and that's why it's apocrypha, is that it's not validated. But the prayer is all about this humility, the apology and the humility. He entreated God, and, and God heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. He humbled himself after he was taken captive, and God brought him back. It goes on to describe how Manasseh tried to reverse what he did, right? But he died, and then his son did what he did originally, which was bad, right? But Manasseh repented and humbled himself. Isaiah 57 is saying, look at these wicked rulers you have. They're doing wickedness. Then it says, but if you trust in me and you humble yourself, I'll give mercy. Not only is that speaking about future salvation in the kingdom, that's speaking about Manasseh. That's what he did. He humbled himself and he got mercy. And he got brought back into the land. The kingdom became his again. Then he died, right? So it's interesting that, that parallel there. Second Chronicles chapter 33 in verse 19, his prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sin and his trespass and the places wherein he had built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled. They are written in the sayings of the seers. It says it's described in the prophets, all the things he did before he humbled himself. That's what we're reading tonight, right? Manasseh's sins. In verse 23 of the, uh, the verse, uh, the chapter, he humbled not himself. Uh, this is Ammon, his son. Ammon, his son, who became king after him, humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. So what's remembered of Manasseh in verse 23? That he humbled himself. That's interesting. Remember the parable Jesus gave? Who gets the kingdom? The one who says he's going to do right, but doesn't do it, or the one who doesn't do it, and then says he will at the end? The one to whom the Lord comes and finds him doing his will. Manasseh was still alive. He was being punished, but he humbled himself. The Lord brought him back. And what's remembered in verse 23 is that he humbled himself. So Ammon did not do what his father did. He didn't humble himself. But he did what his father did before he humbled himself. You see? So that's interesting how the, the Bible there remembers Manasseh, even though the majority of verses describe his wickedness. I'm pretty sure that's a good testimony to Israel and the rest of everybody, that if you humble yourself, you say, what about the wickedness I did? Well, Manasseh did pretty much a lot of wickedness. He humbled himself and got the kingdom, right? Can you see a little bit of grace in there? Yeah, a lot. Not this dispensation. He's not going back to a body of Christ. He, it's different. But he shows his love towards sinners today, and it's a blatant message. Here's an exception to the rule almost, it seems like. In this dispensation, that's how everyone's saved, right? You're a wicked sinner. You trust what Christ did on the cross, and you get saved. What about your contrition or humiliation it's all about what Christ did in his humiliation? So that's the teaching of grace today. Verse 16 and 17 of Isaiah 57. It says, I will not contend forever. That is, he will, he's not going to deal and negotiate and wait for them forever. And neither will I always be wroth. I'm going to pour out judgment, but I'm not going to pour out judgment forever. For the spirit should, fa should fail before me. The spirit, like man's spirit. You should, your spirit should humble itself before me. Right? Either by my long suffering towards you or my judgment, each of those has the goal of causing your spirit to fail in yourself and trusting him. Right? And the souls which I have made, that's Israel and also humanity. Verse 17, for the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth. Reason why God pours judgment out is because of the sin. And he smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. 
I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. So he's seen the ways of his heart. What does Isaiah 55 say? If you forsake the thoughts of his heart, right? If you forsake his ways and if he turn from his unrighteousnesses, I will heal him. I will lead him. Psalm 23 talks about that. I'll lead him beside still waters. I'll lead him into that kingdom. I will heal him because he, he, that kingdom, there's no sickness there. I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts. There's a time of restoration. He will give those that mourn. What's he give them? The kingdom in Matthew 5. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. He creates the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to them that are far off and he will heal them. Luke 2, 14, the saying would come to pass then, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Right? That's when that happens. When he comes back and brings the kingdom and he creates that peace, peace to everybody on earth. Right? That says everybody, right? To them that is far off, to them that is near. It's this verse here. Well, I won't go there right now. Look at Hosea. This is where he put Hosea 14. There's connections here, folks, to prophecy. In Hosea 14, verse 1, I'll read it to you here. It says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. That's what happens in Isaiah 57. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. That's what they should say. That's what Isaiah 57 is saying. Turn from your wickedness. Trust me. I'll give you mercy and grace, right? It says, so will we render the calves of our lips. Asher will not save us, false god. We will not ride upon horses, another nation. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. That's what Isaiah 57 just said, didn't it? They trusted their own hands. They trusted the false gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding, it says. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them. I will be as the dew unto Israel, and shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots to, as Lebanon. This is the kingdom. When Israel receives the Lord graciously, that's the kingdom. Right? And that's how they'll receive him. Do you see how you understanding God's grace today explains how God's going to save Israel in the future? How can God do that? How can God give a wicked city and a wicked nation and a wicked people a kingdom? If they humble themselves and they trust him, according to the covenant, God give them grace. All right? Hosea 14. Paul quotes this verse. Did you know that? In Ephesians chapter 2, in the very place he describes the mystery of Christ, he quotes this verse. People have the wrong idea that if Paul quotes prophecy, that means he's not talking about you. Well, prophecy is not talking about you. But Ephesians 2 is definitely talking about you. He quotes prophecy because of what he's saying about you. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 17. He came and preached peace to you which are far off, and to them that were nigh. You know that verse? That is Isaiah 57, verse 19. Okay. And people look at that and they say, well, there it is. Isaiah 57 says, you humble yourself, God gives grace, and he'll give you the fruits of your lips, peace, to those that are near and far off. That is Ephesians 2, right? He gives grace to people that are near and far off. That's a similarity. Grace, grace to all people, to all people. Question. How do you get grace? How do you get grace to all in Ephesians 2? Look at Ephesians 2 verse 15. Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. Here you get grace without the law. Right? Right? Verse 15, it says, to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Peace here is declared as a result of the one new man coming together. In Isaiah 57, peace is created because of Israel's rise in the kingdom and the nations coming to it. So you have a body, you have without the law, in verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. There's no law, there's no Israel, there's one body, which means there's no kingdom, it's a body, it's not a nation. And that's where he quotes, for through him, we uh, he says, he came and preached peace to you which are far off into the more nigh. He quotes that because he's, give, he's preaching peace from Christ to Jew and Gentile. And they're going, well, how can you do that, Paul? 
The prophet said that would happen. He's teaching it happening out of due time, in a one body, according to a mystery. He's not saying the kingdom is now. That's obviously not happening. What is happening is peace is being offered to Jew and Gentile without there being Israel, without there being a kingdom, right? So Isaiah 57 says, Peace, peace to them that are far off, saith the Lord, and I will heal them. Paul doesn't quote that part. Or this part. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. Got a message the other day that talked about God's grace given to all, like everybody gets God's grace. Uh, well, if you're in the body of Christ, you get it. But if you're not, you don't. Here it says, the peace here is to all the earth in the kingdom, but if you're the wicked, you don't get in. The kingdom's not the body, but there's peace here that don't get, there's the wicked that don't get peace because they don't repent. Okay, they're like the troubled sea, they're like the ocean. They can never rest and be established and be still. Jesus, in a boat with people to whom he said, you will receive the kingdom, rose up and said, peace, be still. And the disciples were with him going, whoa. They trusted in him. He calmed the waters. Right? He could have had a full-time job doing that. But he didn't. He did it for the disciples, those that trusted him as the Messiah. Right? And so the wicked don't get peace. Those that trust him did and will. Right? That's Isaiah 57. In that phrase, there's no peace to the wicked is what followed Isaiah 47 and what will follow Isaiah 66 as well. So we're in a new section next week. Any questions or comments about this chapter?